on World News Tonight. New Horizons. India and Russia get together to discuss the joint futures of the two upcoming economic superpowers. Escalating violence. Civilians run out of necessities in Khartoum as violence between Sudan's government and paramilitary groups intensify. Putin's visit. The Russian president visits the newly liberated regions that were once under Ukrainian control. What's the G7's response? Find out tonight. And making a splash. Thousands gather in China's southwest to celebrate China's water sprinkling festival. This is Adhaderana World News Tonight, reporting from Colombo. Here is Anuradhi Vikramasinghe. Good evening and you're watching World News. Now starting off tonight is a meeting that calls the West to rethink their approach on improving economic trade ties. Russia and India holding the motion of improving economic ties have made an announcement that could deepen bilateral commercial ties that have flourished since war broke out in Ukraine. The FTA talks mark a step up in economic relations between the two countries despite calls from Western countries for India to gradually distance itself from its dominant weapon supplier Russia over its February 2022 invasion of Ukraine. India and Russia are discussing a free trade agreement. According to Indian ministers, a move that would further deepen bilateral commercial ties that have flourished since war broke out in Ukraine. India's Foreign Minister Subramaniam Jai Shankar told an event in New Delhi his government was in advanced negotiation on a trade treaty that Russia's trade and industry minister Denis Monturov said that would bring a guarantee of bilateral investment. India has not explicitly criticized Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which Moscow describes as a special military operation and has called for a peaceful resolution for the conflict through dialogue. Russia, a traditional defense equipment supplier, also displaced Iraq last month to become India's top supplier of crude oil. Overall, Indian imports from Russia increased almost fourfold to 46.33 US dollars in the year to March 31st. Indian media reported in November that Russia was potentially seeking to import more than 500 products from India for key sectors including cars, aircraft and trains as Western sanctions undermine Moscow's ability to keep coal industries operating. India too aims to narrow its growing trade deficit with Russia, which has been India's largest supplier for military equipment for decades and it is the fourth biggest market for Indian pharmaceuticals. Jai Shankar said that Indian businesses could benefit from Russian technology and that New Delhi was working out to iron out payments, certificates and logistic issues. Meanwhile, dozens of civilians have been killed and hundreds more injured in the ongoing fighting between Sudanese government troops and paramilitary fighters known as the Rapid Support Forces. On the streets of Khartoum, civilians are describing scenes of chaos as they desperately try to source basic necessities like water and medicine. The US, Russia and Gulf nations are closely watching the armed conflict in Sudan as the possibility of protracted fighting complicates an already long-running economic crisis in the country. The world is watching as a deadly power struggle unfolds between rival military factions in Sudan. I strongly condemn the outbreak of fighting that is taking place in Sudan. It's a fragile situation. The country is in a strategic location, bordering the Red Sea, the Sahel and the Horn of Africa. And the conflict could destabilize an already volatile region. Here's what's at stake for international actors in the crisis. The White House has called for an immediate ceasefire to the fighting. Western powers, including the U.S., had swung behind a transition towards democratic elections following the overthrow of President Omar al-Bashir in 2019. After a military coup in 2021, they suspended financial support and backed a plan for a new transition and a civilian government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Western powers also fear the potential for a Russian base on the Red Sea, which Sudanese military leaders have expressed openness to. An agreement to host a base was originally reached under Bashir, and military leaders have said it remains under review. Moscow has long sought warm water ports for its navy, and in 2020, President Vladimir Putin said he approved a proposal to set up a logistics hub in Sudan. One of the key players in the current conflict, General Mohamed Hamdan Dagalo, or Hamedti, visited Russia earlier this year 
and said Sudan had no problem with countries opening bases so long as they don't pose a threat to national security. Along with Russia, Hamedti has struck up relations with other powers such as the United Arab Emirates. It, along with fellow energy-rich power Saudi Arabia, has sought to shape events in Sudan. They see the transition away from Bashir's rule as a way to roll back Islamist influence and bolster stability in the region, along with the U.S. and Britain. Meanwhile, change-averse Egypt is the most important backer of Sudan's armed forces and Army Chief General Abdel Fattah al-Burhan, another key player in the current conflict. Calls for a ceasefire and a return to talks are looking bleak. The possibility of protracted fighting increases the risk for civil war and complicates an already long-running economic crisis, as well as humanitarian needs in Sudan. Now, President Vladimir Putin has visited two command posts in Russia's newly incorporated territories where he reviewed the progress of the military operation against Ukrainian forces. According to the Kremlin, Putin traveled to the command center of the Nepier battleground located in the Kherson area. He received reports from the group's commander, Colonel General Oleg Makrovich and Colonel General Mikhail Teplinsky, the commander of Russia's airborne troops. The president also made a trip to the Lugansk People's Republic where he visited the Vostok command center of the National Guard. Putin discussed the situation in the area with top military officials, including Colonel General Alexander Lapin. Putin's surprise visit comes as Kyiv prepares to launch a counteroffensive in which Western-supplied heavy tanks and new armored vehicles are expected to be involved. Ukrainian Prime Minister Denis Shmigal said on Monday that Kyiv will start the operation in the nearest future. The recent months of the Ukraine conflict have been marked by fierce fighting for the Donbass mining city of Aryomovsk, known to Ukrainians as Bakhmut. Evgeny Prigozhin, the head of the Russian private military company Wagner Group, claimed last week that his forces controlled more than 80 percent of the city. The Russian Defense Ministry said that Wagner fighters, along with airborne troops, were working to push Ukrainian soldiers from the city center to its western suburbs. U.S. law enforcement officials arrested two New York residents for allegedly operating a Chinese secret police station in Manhattan's Chinatown, part of a crackdown on Beijing's alleged targeting of U.S.-based dissidents. Liu Jianwang and Chen Jinping face charges of conspiring to act as agents of China's government without informing U.S. authorities and obstruction of justice. Two Chinese Americans were arrested for allegedly operating a secret police station on behalf of the Chinese government in the heart of New York City. One of them, 61-year-old Lu Jianwang, was seen leaving a Brooklyn federal courthouse on Monday after he was released on bond. On the far left in this court sketch is 59-year-old Chen Jinping. The pair face charges of conspiring to act as agents of Beijing without informing U.S. authorities and obstructing justice. In addition, federal prosecutors also on Monday unveiled charges for many others suspected of harassing U.S.-based Chinese dissidents. According to authorities, Liu and Chen worked from an office in a nondescript building near the Manhattan Bridge. Before it closed in 2022, the office described itself as a gathering spot for people from China's Fujian province. The site appeared to help Chinese nationals with paperwork, like renewing their driver's licenses. But U.S. Attorney Brion Peace said on Monday there was more beneath the surface. The secret police station appears to have had a more sinister use. On at least one occasion, an official with the Chinese National Police directed one of the defendants, a U.S. citizen who worked at the secret police station, to help locate a pro-democracy activist of Chinese descent living in California. In other words, the Chinese National Police appear to have been using the station to track a U.S. resident on U.S. soil. Once they got whiffed, the FBI was onto them. Liu and Chen deleted their communications with a Chinese government official, which they later admitted to FBI agents. The charges also state Liu tried to persuade a Chinese dissident to return to China in 2018. The victim reported he was repeatedly harassed. His family in the U.S. received threats of violence and Chinese officers harassed his family in China. U.S. prosecutors on Monday also unveiled charges for 42 other Chinese nationals. They include 34 public security officers belonging to a task force allegedly operating as a troll farm, creating fake profiles to harass and threaten dissidents and activists online. 
and eight Chinese government officials are now listed as defendants in a case announced in 2020, charging a former China-based executive of Zoom with disrupting video meetings commemorating the 1989 Tiananmen Square protests, which is a taboo subject in China. Beijing's embassy in Washington has yet to respond to a request for comment. Last October, charges were unsealed against seven Chinese nationals, alleged to be part of a state-sponsored campaign to strong-arm dissidents to repatriate to China. In November, FBI Director Christopher Wray told a Senate committee he was very concerned about the presence of stations in other U.S. cities like the alleged one in New York. The U.S. House of Representatives Speaker Kevin McCarthy on Monday outlined a federal spending cut plan being sought by his fellow Republicans with ideas already floated and rejected by Democrats and warning that these conditions must be attached to an urgently needed increase in the government's debt ceiling. The Republican leader of the U.S. House of Representatives on Monday proposed a deal to raise the federal debt ceiling in exchange for spending cuts. Our proposal will examine wasteful Washington spending and executive overreach in all forms. Among other items, it will claw back tens of billions of dollars in COVID-related money. The proposal by House Speaker Kevin McCarthy at the New York Stock Exchange comes as the federal government ticks closer to the moment sometime this summer when it will no longer be able to pay its bills, including interest on its debt, without legislation to increase the current $31.4 trillion borrowing limit. Without action by the divided Congress, that failure would trigger a historic default that would shake the U.S. and world economies. Let me be clear, defaulting on our debt is not an option. But neither is a future of higher taxes, higher interest rates, more dependency on China, an economy that doesn't work for working Americans. But McCarthy has already floated this proposal, one rejected by Democrats. President Joe Biden's Democrats, who also control the Senate, have been at loggerheads with Republicans for months over next steps on the limit, with the White House insisting Congress lift the borrowing limit without conditions, as it did three times under former Republican President Donald Trump. Senate Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. The solution here is straightforward. Republicans should work with Democrats in good faith to avoid default together, just as we did under President Trump. Just as what President Reagan talked about. No blackmail. No brinksmanship. No default. Democrats also have pushed McCarthy to lay out a specific budget plan. So far, House Republicans have not proposed a budget of their own, a move Biden contends would be a necessary starting point for negotiations on spending. McCarthy and Republicans hold a narrow 222 to 213 majority, including a contingent of hardline members who dismiss the risks of failure to act on the debt ceiling. The White House last month proposed its own budget, which it said would cut the nation's deficit by nearly $3 trillion over 10 years, though it relied on increases in taxes on businesses and the wealthy rather than spending cuts to do so. Let's go for a short commercial break. You're watching World News. Welcome back. Now, amid allegations of the U.S. spying on South Korea after the recent leak of intelligence documents, Washington says it has a good relationship with Seoul, saying there has been no damage to its partnerships with allies because of the leak. The suggestion that Washington has been spying on some of its allies, including South Korea, following the recent leak of classified documents, has put the U.S.-South Korea alliance in the spotlight less than two weeks ahead of a Biden-Yoon presidential summit. During a briefing on Monday, Deputy Pentagon Press Secretary Sabrina Singh said an internal review assessment is being conducted and that the Department of Justice is leading an ongoing investigation to better understand the scope and scale of the leaks, including getting a better assessment of what documents exactly were disclosed and where they surfaced online. The Secretary and senior Pentagon officials continue to convene daily meetings to examine the scope and scale of this disclosure as well as ensure that appropriate mitigation measures are being taken. There's also some speculation that the leaked documents are forgeries. 
U.S. Secretary of Defense Lloyd Austin and his South Korean counterpart Lee jong sup spoke last week and both agreed that the classified document had been substantially forged. When asked about this, Singh said the situation is under review and refrained from giving specifics. And as to whether Washington would apologize to Seoul if wiretapping allegations turned out to be true, the press secretary reiterated that the U.S. commitment to South Korea is rock solid and that Washington has a positive relationship with Seoul. On the same day, National Security Council coordinator John Kirby said that there had been no damage to partnerships with allies due to the leaks. Singh added that the relevant departments will provide the secretary with initial findings and recommendations within 45 days to improve the department's policies and procedures related to the protection of classified information. The UN Security Council meeting on North Korea's launch of its first solid fuel Hwasong-18 ICBM ended with no fruitful outcome. The North slammed the meeting saying its strategic weapon development is a means of self-defense. Last Thursday, North Korea fired its solid fuel Hwasong-18 intercontinental ballistic missile for the first time. The United Nations Security Council responded by holding an open meeting at UN headquarters in New York on Monday, with the meeting being convened at the request of South Korea, the United States and Japan. During the meeting, U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations Linda Thomas-Greenfield strongly condemned North Korea's repeated violations of Security Council resolutions, calling for a united response from the international community on what she called a threat to not just Northeast Asia, but also to world peace and security. Along with the U.S., other UNSC members, including Britain and France, expressed concerns over continued provocations from North Korea. But China again backed its ally, saying that United States military exercises near the Korean Peninsula using nuclear aircraft carriers and B-52 bombers made North Korea uneasy. Russia's ambassador to the U.N. also slammed the U.S., saying that the UNSC meetings should not be used for political propaganda purposes, adding that additional sanctions against North Korea is illegal and unilateral and would not take into account the desperate situation inside the country. Meanwhile, in a statement carried by the state-run Korean Central News Agency, Vice Chairman of the Central Military Commission of the ruling Workers' Party, Lee byung chul accused the UNSC of engaging in domestic interference against Pyongyang. He also stressed that the North's advanced strategic weapons development is a legitimate self-defense measure aimed at defending itself from threats from the U.S. Lee also slammed the U.S. for calling the North's exercise of rights to self-defense a provocation and threat through the mobilization of the UNSC. The vice chairman is known to have led Pyongyang's nuclear and missile development since the early months of Kim Jong-un's rule in late 2011. A French court acquitted Airbus and Air France of manslaughter charges over the 2009 crash of Flight 447 from Rio to Paris, prompting an outpouring of anguish from people whose loved ones were killed in a disaster that led to lasting changes in aircraft safety measures. Fourteen years later, and finally a verdict in the trial over the crash of Air France Flight 447 from Rio to Paris. Judges cleared Air France and plane manufacturer Airbus of involuntary manslaughter, but they said they bore civil responsibility for the accident. A decision that brings more confusion than closure for the victims' families. They used the word responsible, and they said Airbus and Air France made errors, and many of them, and yet they are acquitted. I find it very difficult to understand my country's judicial system. Lawyers representing the families of the victims said the verdict would do nothing to end their ordeal. It's hard to understand for the families. It's torture. But what we should take from this is that Airbus and Air France were found responsible, no matter the nuance between criminal and civil. Air France issued a statement saying it takes note of the ruling. It will always remember the victims of this terrible accident and expresses its deepest sympathy to all of their loved ones. On the 1st of June 2009, the Airbus A330 crashed into the sea off the coast of Brazil, killing all 228 people on board. It was Air France's worst ever accident. The official investigation found that several factors contributed, including pilot error and the icing over of external sensors called pitot tubes, which have since been removed from planes. The families of the victims can still appeal the court's decision. 
we have some good news for you. A personalized mRNA vaccine that combats a deadly form of skin cancer can reduce patients' risk of recurrence or death when combined with an immunotherapy drug, new research suggests. The results from a phase two trial of the melanoma vaccine were presented at a meeting of the American Association for Cancer Research, though they have not been peer reviewed. Tonight, what may be a watershed moment for fighting cancer. The data were pretty darn impressive. In a stage two clinical trial, researchers like Dr. Jeffrey Weber found adding an mRNA cancer vaccine to standard treatment reduced the chances for melanoma recurrence or death by 44 percent. Research on the vaccine was started before an mRNA vaccine was used for COVID, and it works similarly. Doctors use a blueprint from a patient's individual tumor to encode a personalized vaccine. In 2019, Gary Keblish got the devastating diagnosis, advanced melanoma, the deadliest form of skin cancer. I feel that I probably would have been one of those statistics had I not been involved in the clinical trial. More than three years later, Gary is still cancer free. Taking this vaccine has given me freedom. The vaccine now goes to a much bigger stage three clinical trial over the next few years before it could be commercially available. But researchers are hopeful for melanoma and maybe someday other cancers. And Roxy. A win, which tonight may be one big step closer. Welcome back. And for more news, let's take you around the world in a minute. Elon Musk's SpaceX called off a highly anticipated launch of its powerful new Starship rocket, delaying the first uncrewed test flight of the vehicle into space. Peruvian archaeologists discovered the remains of a 500-year-old Inca bathroom in central Peru. The Inca bath is the second one found in the Huanuco Pampa archaeological site, whose complexity and dimensions are larger than previously known. The structure is two meters deep and has two asymmetrical enclosures. Rescuers combed through the rubble after a powerful storm tore across Mississippi, killing at least 25 people there, and one person in Alabama as it leveled hundreds of buildings and spawned at least one devastating tornado. Nepal's holy Bhaktapur city witnessed a sea of devotees who gathered to celebrate the lunar new year that marks the arrival of a new season by participating in processions and dancing. A scientific expedition has discovered a previously unknown coral reef with abandoned marine life off Ecuador's Galapagos Islands. The reef has more than 50% living coral. And that is all from us here at World News Tonight. Join us again tomorrow as we keep you up to date with the latest from around the world. In case you miss any of the stories tonight, you can always watch the whole program on our YouTube channel, youtube.com slash other there in English. And finally tonight, we join the people of several Chinese ethnic minority groups as they begin to celebrate the traditional water sprinkling festival in southwest China's Yunnan province. Thank you for watching. Have a great night.